production facility, those machines that build, that make the books, right? So there is a human labor requirement to invent that and then do that. And okay. maintain it. And maintain it. We can get into maintenance a little bit too. We, we don't exactly make things to the utmost of their efficiency or utmost of their no. material long longevity. Mm -hmm. it, we could make things last hundreds of years. We don't make things to last hundreds of years. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I work in the space industry. We've got to make stuff that goes up into space that is as wicked, more harsh environment than anything you're going to find here on Earth unless you start going into the deep bowels of the Earth, like volcanic vents and stuff are pretty nasty too. But these satellites have to work for 10, 15, 20 years, communication satellites. Voyager would be an example of a system, and you're talking 70s technology, that went into building this spacecraft that is still ticking. It has a radio isothermic generator, a little nuclear generator on it, and it will last for like a couple of hundred years, and it's just taken off, and it's still working. So, and the rover's on Mars. Three month lifespan, or whatever, and they've been there over five years. So the space industry knows how to make stuff that lasts a wicked long time. But in the free market system, does it make sense to make a product that will last generations? No, because if you did, what is your next model? How are you going to continue your profit base? Uh, in the video, you guys talk about uh, society as constantly evolving, right? So I would argue it doesn't make sense, you know, Back in the day, sure, TVs were made. I used to sell TVs at Best Buy for like three and a half years. It was a great gig, and I learned a lot about them. And it was when the plasmas were coming on the market, and they were like $5,000. Now you can get a, a large one for 1000 or less. Right. But uh, I don't think it would make sense, not necessarily for the reason that you always want to come, and it's the greed, and they want to drive the profit back to them. But uh, as technology is continuously evolving and advancing, especially at a more, um, a, a more rapid rate, uh, I would think that it would, you know, I expect to buy a new laptop, you know, every five to ten years, or a new, you know, new technology comes out. It's because more, it's better. Because it's better. Right. Because yes. of because of the constant improvements. The constant improvements. Okay. Then we go with the Lego model. The Lego model says, okay, industry standard. Here's the basic rudimentary setup of a television that that we have of at the moment. This is what we're going to use for basically about twenty years until we get to a point where it makes resource sense to switch over to a different look. But now let's say our plasma tube generators get better, or our plasma generators get better inside the tube. Well, that's a widget that can be pulled out and a new one can be plugged in. Now you've upgraded your entire television to the new standard without having to buy a whole new television. So it's all parts and pieces that, and what makes, in the resource-based economic system, everybody has access to that information. We know what parts are interchangeable, and, and everything open is. It, yeah, it's open source. The whole thing is interchangeable. Mm -hmm. So if I get a new screen, I can pop out the screen and put in the new one and then recycle the old one as much as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. So instead of the current model, which is specialized, you know, I'm going to create a TV with Sony's brand of design. And then Magnavox is going to have its brand of design. And now those two aren't compatible. Why? Because they're in competition with each other. Well, I mean, I think it's a, a false assumption to assume that there could create this ideal form of the TV. Uh, I don't see why someone else couldn't come along and say, you know, I like this inter and I, I'm, I, I would hope that that have already occurred, uh, you know, to come up with this type of thing, which you would still replace. And people would also buy these ex uh, exchange parts if it did exist in the current system. But what happens when the other innovator or technician comes along and says, hey, Eureka, I have a whole new concept, a whole new thing that we never even thought of for, you know, this is innovation for projecting images to, you know, for uh, viewership enjoyment. And they come along and in a free market enterprise, of course, there would be competition. And the market, which is based on people voting with their dollars or whatever form of indirect exchange, and our right. dollars mm -hmm. are taboo on shows like this, yeah, I'm okay with dollars. <laughs> I'm okay with dollars because that's what we have now. I'm, I'm okay sure. with understanding yeah. the system we're in. So I would hope that uh, you know the better product would eventually win out or become more affordable or uh, you know and again back to the existing structure the the company that is able to build the plasma TV that lasts longer is going to have more uh, business. They might be able to offer more premium, but at the same time because more people are in demand, they could mass produce more of them at the same time. 
And uh, I, I see how, how that cycle gets trapped in when televisions, but I still think even if it was the system that you're talking about, there could still be the opportunity for more innovation and more competition. Would people just come together and, and how do they determine which particular set that they would like to have in there? If this is in the ideal of All right, the all right. Uh, one of the misconceptions is that you would only design one variable of something and then, okay, everything must adapt to this. I don't subscribe to that. I mean, there's ergonomic issues. People have different things that they like, so there are personal preferences. Mm -hmm. So you would create like a top five or ten model, you know, and that's all done through, we do this now when, companies do this now when they do demographic analysis of, mm -hmm. I have a new widget, and they do product testing. And they say, do you like, and they do surveys, how many people like this particular widget or the way it's designed? And they play with it a little while, and they go, no, I don't like that button there, switch mm -hmm. that. And then they change it. Well, in the RBE, it'd be no different. It'd be the same thing. The difference is there's no money motivation to do it. It's an ergonomic technical efficiency motivation to do it. It's we're going to make 20 different versions of a cell phone instead of today where we make thousands and thousands of different versions of cell phones. We've got little extremely crap cell phones that are really cheap and break within a year or so. I mean, my father is, is uh, a perfect example. He recently got a phone, one of those like Boost Mobiles or whatever. And the phone crapped out in, like three months, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not a good phone. But then you've got like iPhone or Android or Droid or something like that. These are phones that can last a while. The only thing you really need to upgrade on those is the software right. that really runs them. So then that's just a plug in and a reset and boom, now you have the, the next best thing. But you've got the version that you like. Mm -hmm. So you create 20 or so different versions based on what what the surveys say, what people generally like. And for the most part, 20 would probably be more than enough because, oddly enough, people think they're unique and individuals, but a lot of them have the same ergonomic wants. You know, the certain... Five hands, five yeah, fingers. Five fingers. Yeah, five fingers. I mean, when it comes to basic human function, we're all kind of the same <laughs> in, that, in that respect. So the products that you develop would follow within those lines. And so you don't create just one object and tell everybody to deal with it. And this is all, and then we're just going to interchange those parts. You create like 20 versions of it to to deal with people's you know personal personal wants, color, things like that. But you're still creating much less than we do today, with the overabundance of production for specific demographics or for uh, uh, waste. You know, just quick throwaway models of this, that, and the other thing. You don't do that in the RB. You create everything to last as long as possible. And then when that new guy comes out and says, oh, I just had a revolutionary breakthrough. We can now tap, you know, nanophotons, a new kind of photon we found and invented, and we can do this and do that. Be like, all right, here's where the engineering genius comes in. Can you retrofit that into the existing models? Is there a way you can make it plug in? So that's where the next, that's where the challenge is. People say, well, what would people be motivated to do? That kind of stuff. Can I get it to fit into that? And then if not, after proper scientific study, two or three year study, say, no, actually, we really can't. Okay, now we go about recycling all the old stuff, building brand new models that fit that new technology. But it's really no different than the five or 10 year turnaround that we have now. Sure. Um, it's just <coughs> without a monetary push to it. That's the only difference. Uh -huh. John, I'd like to hear your thoughts or feelings on what some economists call the contradiction to capitalism, that is technological unemployment. For instance, I was just watching a few videos where there's a group in Israel where they're implementing touchscreen ordering systems in restaurants. There's other restaurants that have fully automated kitchens as well as automated wait staffs, whereas employers are outsourcing to robotics and machine technology and replacing employees to a point where if this takes a hold in such a large fashion, there won't be the purchasing power to even purchase the goods and services and products being put out by the market. Okay. Uh, well, I think whenever you have technological advances, for example, you know, a lot of the HEBs, the checkouts are automated. You mm -hmm. can check yourself out. Well, perhaps one teller job is gone. I guess this goes back to the good old broken window fallacy or economics in one lesson by Han Henry Hazlitt, uh, which has the, uh, uh, the unseen hand, mm -hmm. whereby, you know, it breaks basically the broken window fallacy is uh, somebody, the kids down the street throw a rock through the uh, shopkeep's uh, window and someone says, "Oh wow, there's a broken window. That's going to create economic development right. for the window maker." Yeah, for the window. When in reality, the unseen thing is that now the shopkeep, the twenty dollars that he gives to the broken window, his next most valuable use in his eyes, subjective theory of value again, was uh, the pair of shoes that he was going to create business for the, the shoe keep. Or the reinvestment into his own business. That twenty bucks could have been used right. to improve his that's own right. thing. That's right. right. That's right. 
Um, and again, that goes back to whatever his individual value system uh, is based on. And I believe that's the best way to uh, organize an economy based on individual value systems. Um, but basically, the touch screen had to, first of all, have been thought up uh, in a technological manner. Someone had to have gone to school to, and, and this is the existing society regardless mm -hmm. of how it would pan out in the, what were you, ER? What was the, the two letters you were using to describe the uh, abundance economy? Just no, like, RBE. RBE. Yeah, resource-based economy. Resource-based yes. economy. Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> um, TVP ad advocates the RBE. People think TVP, the Venus Project, in and of itself is the system. Mm. That's not actually true. It's the a means to the end. It's just the name of the organization that sure. promotes the resource-based economic model. That's yeah. really all it is. So now there's a demand for these touch screens. Well, there's also a demand for programmers. There's a demand for university professors. There's a demand for technical schools. There's a demand for, through the division of labor and specialization and uh, the capitalist process, uh, there's demand for replacement screens. Uh, there's also a demand for a programmer to oversee it and make sure it fits in with their particular system. Now maybe they have to upgrade their servers at the grocery store. Now there's a whole nother labor market for the person that's building the server, not to mention the technological advances and the programming of the server as well. So I would argue that uh, while it may seem that the, the teller is out of a job, the unseen hand, there's 10 new jobs that have been created. And that's, that's to the first part. The second part of your question seemed a little more technical. Maybe we could run it by again. No, uh, you addressed it. Okay. That was it. All right. There might be a little too much credence onto the additional job developments, only yeah. in this sense, only in this sense. Yeah. The guy who invented the touchscreen, that touchscreen isn't just used for the store, but it can be used for a whole bunch of other things. So you have one guy whose invention is now cross-platformed amongst a whole other things. Mm -hmm. Whereas the way you're thinking is the need of that one touch screen has increased a whole bunch of other jobs for the creation of that or for the functionality of that. Production. Or the production of that. It's, it can be the opposite. It could be only one guy can invent that touch screen and then it's used in a whole bunch of places. So it's, it's, a, it's backwards. But as far as like the maintenance and the monitoring and the production, a lot of that can be largely automated anyway. In fact, a lot of that is largely automated. And again, you've got to create the machine to right. automate that. And those people will be jobs. there. Those are the jobs that matter. The, uh, I don't want to say that because people are like, well, that sounds technical. <laughs> My job doesn't matter. Yeah, no. Um, those are the jobs that facilitate that particular kinds of advancement and evolution. But then you have jobs like the garbage man. You know, I'm sure if you interviewed all of the Austin City garbage men and asked them what they wanted to be when they grew up, I doubt very seriously the majority of them would say, I wanted to be a garbage man. I'm sure if you interview the, the homeless man, he's, he would say, I, I hope that I would have had a job. Right, exactly. He has a better condition than this other individual. Right, and, and so, you know, there are goals and aspirations, but like the, the garbage man, could we do that? Can we do away with that job? Yeah, if we design city systems efficiently mm -hmm. and use the automated technology properly, we could do away with the garbage man. Mm -hmm. But when you throw in the unions and the labor for income and the mm -hmm. need to make money to survive, mm -hmm. even though technically if you were dropped on an island and just had plenty of food, water, and animals, you wouldn't need money to survive. You could survive. So money isn't necessary to survive. It's not like it's oxygen. You know, It's a system we created to facilitate a particular need when that need was relevant. But when you start getting to the point where you start developing technologies and innovating systems that bypass the human labor for income requirement altogether, not that it, you know, your demand, you're, you're saying, you know, the touchscreen guy develops other jobs. Well, those other jobs could be automated too. So then what about those other jobs? Those could be automated too. How far down the line do you go? Eventually what you originally might have thought would require 100 people ends up requiring only 10 because a lot of it could be automated down all the way through the entire you know, means of need for that particular widget. And so when you get to that level, and, and we are there now with our advanced computing systems, our robotics, how dexterous everything is, the way these systems work, how fast and efficient they are, they never need brakes 24-7, 365, they're always running, you have eroded that human need to work those kinds of jobs. And so we then develop and adapt to new kinds of jobs. The horse and carriage buggy driver eventually had to say, well, bugger off, I can't do this job anymore, so I'm going to learn and do something else. In the RBE, there is no restriction <clears throat> to what you can learn. Mm -hmm. So let's say, it, now, if you want to be a garbage man, be a garbage man. 
if you want to just work in flowers all day or whatever personal passion somebody has, even if it's a job that I would say, dude, I would never do that job. That's okay. That's me, not them. If they like to do it, do it. Even if that job can be automated. So what? It's not hurting the system. It's not hurting anybody else. There is no zero sum game in that. They like to do that.